Welcome to Your Mac Life for Wednesday, September, September, Wednesday, August the 30th. I'm thinking already into next month, 2017. This is Your Mac Life. I am your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining me, whether you're listening in live or tuned in by the archive. Can you believe summer is almost, all, almost over? It's actually raining outside here in Vancouver for the first time in months. We're having significant rainfall here in Vancouver, but we can use it. It's, it's been quite a while. Um, first off, to anyone who is in or has friends and or family, loved ones in the Houston, Texas area, I hope everyone that you know is safe. I hope everyone that you know who they know is safe. Uh, awful, awful storm, devastation in Houston. For those folks who live in the Vancouver area, I saw an amazing stat that – in the last two or three days, Houston has gotten as much rain as Vancouver gets in a year. And Vancouver gets a lot of rain. So that's the kind of devastation they're looking at in Houston. So hopefully everyone that uh, you know and I know are safe in Houston. If you can afford to give, please give. Thoughts and prayers are not good enough. Um, donate to local charities. Uh, I've been sending out tweets trying to get people to avoid Donating the Red Cross specifically, donate more specifically to local groups that you can find online. Uh, if you want to support them through the Red Cross, be my guest. I personally don't send money to the Red Cross because too much of their money goes to other places. So uh, I look for charities that are closer to home as opposed to these big gener general ones. Don't send stuff. They need money. Let them send them money and let them figure out what stuff they need for this kind of giving. You know, in your local city, you know, they'll say and say, hey, we need food. We need peanut butter. We need eggs. You can go ahead and donate that stuff. Or in the wintertime, we need clothes, blankets. You can donate that stuff. But when it comes from giving from far away, it's always better to give them money and let them decide on the best way to use your charitable donation. But uh, it's something that you should. Uh, do if you can. Um, make sure, like I said, everyone you know and everyone they know is is safe. So, thoughts and uh, thoughts are going out to everyone uh, in in Houston. Uh, on tonight's show, we won't have our good friend Jim Downpool of the Loop at LoopInsight.com. Jim is traveling today and he can't make it back under the bridge in time for tonight's show, so we won't have Jim. But replacing Jim are two people. Because uh, yes, you need two people to replace one Downpool. That's just just the way it is. The first person we're going to uh, the first person I'm going to talk about is uh, Mike Bombich. I interviewed Mike, oh god, probably 10 years ago when Mike worked for our f favorite fruit company and he was doing this little project on the side, this little uh, uh, backup software called Carbon Copy Cloner. Well, Mike has since left our favorite fruit company and is now doing Carbon Copy Cloner full time. Bombich Software is the website, b o m b i c h software.com. And Carbon Copy Cloner is now up to version 5. And we'll talk to Mike about the software, about how to use it, when to use it, and specifically when not to use it, especially with macOS High Sierra coming up. I'm going to ask him, should I use it to back up High Sierra? We'll talk to him about that and other things. We're also going to, in our starting point photography segment, we're going to be talking about why you should shoot raw. And I'll give you some specific examples, or a very specific example, on the uh, big advantage to shooting in the raw file format. Replacing Jim on the show at the top is a very special guest, a very special surprise guest. And here's a hint for you folks who are watching the video. We're going to have this special guest on right after this musical interlude. So stay tuned. A special guest coming up right after this. This is your Mac Life.
Welcome. Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am Sean King. Joined now in our phone room by our very, very special guest. Special guest, please sign in now. Hello, Sean. <laughs> 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 Folks, that that happily happy giggling voice you hear now is the lovely Melissa. Melissa, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Sean. How are you? I am good. Just want to let I wanted to introduce you to folks because uh, because of this young lady, uh, we from December eighth to December twenty eighth will be in beautiful, beautiful Sydney, <laughs> Australia. No, sorry, Newcastle, Australia. Yes, we will. And why are we going to Newcastle, Australia? Oh, why are we going there? Well, I was born in Newcastle, Australia, so that's one good reason. You were you were born, just to be clear to the audience, you were born in Newcastle, Australia, 35 years ago, weren't you? I was, <laughs> yes, Sean, I was born just 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you left, uh, what, what, what did you do in Australia? Did you go to school in Australia? Why did you leave Australia for Canada? Well, I was planning on leaving, like a lot of young Australians. They all get ready to leave for a very long time because it's too far to go back and keep leaving again. Um, so I was already planning on leaving, but um, my mum died, and so uh -huh. I left, and I just left, and I left, and I didn't, I didn't really go back. And you haven't been back for how long? Oh, well, this time I haven't been back for 18 years. Wow. I know, right? Now, you, you, you do a family still in Newcastle, right? I do. Well, I have family outside of Newcastle. I have, lots of, I have friends in Newcastle, but my family, I was actually brought up on the biggest saltwater lake in the southern hemisphere, Lake Macquarie. It, there's a big channel that leads from the Pacific Ocean into the lake, so it's a saltwater lake. So that's where I was brought up, which is half an hour outside of Newcastle. So my family is there. What Now, we've all heard of Sydney, Australia. We've all heard of various other cities in Australia, but a lot of folks may not be familiar with Newcastle. What kind of town is Newcastle? Hmm. My goodness. You know, I left so young, and now I have to describe it as my 35-year-old self. <laughs> um, well, is it, is, is, is it a tourist town? <laughs> is it a tourist town? Is it well, an industrial it, town? Is it blue-collar? Well, all I can say is from when I left it last, and um, it's very beautiful. It's geographically, it's very beautiful. But okay. it comes. There's a. There's been a lot of industry there, like BHP and the coal mines have, have, were there, and I think some of them still are. But I think it's become very touristy, um, be, simply because the beaches are so gorgeous, and there's so many areas around there that are really beautiful to visit. Mm -hmm. So. I guess I'll see when I get there, won't I? Do I don't think, know what it's become. Do you think it's changed a lot since since you've been there? Have you kept up with oh. the, new, the Newcastle news kind of thing? <laughs> no, 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 my gosh. Not at all. Not at all. I have no idea. I have no idea what it's going to be like. I have no idea what Australia is going to be like. So it's all going to be a, a, a bit of a surprise, I think. It's changed a lot in the last nearly 20 years, I'm sure. How far away is Newcastle from the city that we are all familiar with, uh, Sydney? It's about 200 kilometers north of Sydney. So that's for the, our American friends, but 120 miles, so about a two-hour trip. Yes, yes, exactly. Who are you planning but, on visiting I mean, when yeah. you're in uh, Newcastle? I will, when I'm, in, when I'm home in my hometown, well, I have my brother and my and my uncle and my niece and my nephew, and I've got tons of little cousins that have been born that I haven't met yet. Um, uh, cousins that I knew before when they were little. Um, I've got lots of very dear friends, some of them coming from very far away to see me. Oh, uh, another dear friend in Newcastle who I see every time I go home. She'll, she's still there. Oh, I think that's it, really. I'm looking at a. Yeah. Uh, I, I posted up on the on the show video a. Um, yeah. A Google map of Newcastle, and it looks like to the north of Newcastle, it looks like there's a huge beach. What beach is that? To the north. Yes. Which would that? Oh, is it Nobby's Beach, or is it just the great big ten miles of beach? It looks like big ten miles is of it, beach. Oh, so big ten miles of beach. That's where we'll be closest to. 
so that's just oh my god that's so many different beaches all along there and some of them aren't even named yet it's just a big long 10 mile stretch of golden sandy beach it's not called all anything? Along it's, there. it's not like it's not called bondi, well, bondi end, beach or anything oh well bondi beach is in sydney if that's what you're looking at no no i'm just curious that that you know we civilized people name our beaches <laughs> You're talking about Australia. I don't know if that applies. Oh, um, really? I'm allowed, I'm allowed to say that because I'm Australian. Um, <laughs> well, at, at one end, it's Redhead, and then there's Blacksmith Beach, and then, oh, my gosh, there's all different beaches along there. Wait, wait, but wait, when, I grew, wait, wait, when wait. I grew up, there wasn't wait a second. for all of them. There's a, there's, a yeah, beach, yeah. there's a beach called Redhead Beach? Yes, there is. Is that where you were conceived? <laughs> No, I don't know. I, I could have been. I think a lot of babies are conceived on Australian beaches. <laughs> now, that's something you warned me about. Was that? Did you say a lot of or all Australian beaches are clothing optional? No, I'm not going to say that. Let's just say that you can be extremely, well, let's just say topless girls are you know, it's all good. I, I don't think it. I, I don't think many guys bat an eye any. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of topless girls on Australian beaches, and you know they don't do like like Canadian girls do. That they sort of get up and adjust it all and put it all back on and then go into the water. They just go into the water. Okay, let me get this so, straight. Let me hang on, hang on, hang on, because <laughs> this is important. Yes. This is important. Yes. You said girls. Are the boys girls? also bottomless? Oh no no! Only on they would only do that on, on certain beaches. I'm sure. So only the I, girls I never are saw top. That. Not like a wreck beach, Vancouver thing, where, where all the guys are naked too. So only the girls are in a state of undress on on Australian beaches. Usually, just their tops, not their bottoms, just their tops. But there's very little bottoms, so you know. It doesn't wait. leave much to the imagination. You're saying Australian girls have little bottoms? What? I'm sorry. I missed it. <laughs> Their bikinis aren't very... Uh, oh. There's not okay. a lot of fabric there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's very These funny. funny question. It's, it's very funny w- when you travel. And, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of Americans don't travel nearly as much as, as they should. But it's very interesting to see these kinds of... Uh, social norms and cultural differences between the two. We think of here in, in North America, we think of you know Australians as just being the same as us, air quotes, just with a different yeah. accent. And yet there are that's a significant difference for the uh, the Protestant ethic we seem to have here in North America. That would be scandalous here in North America. I to know have bridges to have to have beaches that easily accessible. And these are these aren't. These aren't like wreck beach where they're private beaches. This is oh, a publicly no, no. accessible beach. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, I think people, that's, I, I think it is a misconception. People think, oh, well, you know, there's not much difference between Canada and Australia. Yeah, yeah. But there is actually. I mean, when I, when I first came to Canada, I, it, it took a long time. It took a long time for me, um, a long time in many different ways to adjust and to figure it out so it was different that's for sure i mean i know it's not like having a language barrier and all that but it's still very different what do you think was the biggest cultural difference between australians and canadians or australians and americans oh well i'm not gonna i can't say too much about australians comparing australians to american because if there's any Aussies listening, they'll they'll find me and track me down and tar and feather me in Australia because I think Australians are much more like Americans than they are Canadians. Oh my, really? Uh, very much in, so. In what way? They're oh, I don't want to get myself into trouble. I don't know how many people are listening to this. It's kind of a very powerful thing being having this and having all these people hearing. Um, well, pretend it's just think, pretend it's just you and me. Uh, Ignore all the other people. Okay. Well, uh, they're you know they like to stand up on their patriotic box, and they're I won't call them insular, but they're uh, they can be crass and loud. And this is very generally speaking, by the way. I mean, I love American people and I love Australian people. This is general observations from me. 
they're just very similar. They're very, um, in many ways, I mean, I, I don't really want to go too much into it, but I think I'd get into trouble with a lot of Australian people <laughs> by saying that. I would. Well, I think I think anyone uh, who has, uh, um, at the very least, gone out drinking with Australian men know they can be loud and crass. Oh, well, that's part of my goal about, that's part of why I want, no, I shouldn't say why I want to go. To go drinking it's with Australian men? No, I want to go home because I want to also show myself uh, as a woman that I've grown into be able to be assertive and strong and powerful with the bloody Australian men. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and that I can handle them and I can do it. And because they, you know, if you're a shy young girl or if you're whatever, it's just, you know, it's not an easy culture to grow up in if you're not, if you're not comfortable being assertive with guys. That's for sure. Really? So are Australian men that, uh, I guess, aggressive is the only way I could describe it? Are, 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 they, are they that overbearing or, or aggressive? They can be. Really? Very I much. Especially when they're Especially when they're around all their friends and yeah. they're in an establishment, well, not even drinking, just when they're around their friends. But again, this is generally speaking, my brother is a lovely man. I'm not going <laughs> to... But and it's just general, just generally, and and I'm also talking from experience because that's what I grew up around. I grew up around that mentality, and it wasn't easy. So you're going to be uh, taking me along to visit family and friends, but we're also going to be, and this is the thing I'm excited about, is the idea of going to see Australia, particularly Newcastle and Sydney, through not only an Australian's eyes, but an Australian who's been away for 20 years. What are some of the things that you think... What are some of the things that you think we're going to see or some of the things that you want to show me? Oh, well, I think one of the things that's going to be a shock to me, and I will love it. I mean, I certainly, this isn't something that I'm not looking forward to. It's just going to be interesting to see how Australia has has adjusted to it. Because when I grew up, I mean, they had an all-white immigration policy until I think the mid-70s. Mm-hmm. So I really grew up in white bread Australia. And I know Australia has become this rich, multicultural country. And and some of the reading that I have done, which is very true, historically, when you come to Australia, you you really become an, you know, an Australian Italian or an Australian, you know, from where, I mean, you really have to adopt being an Australian Mm -hmm. to be accepted. So I'm just interested to see I'm interested and can't wait to see Australia in a multicultural way because I didn't grow up seeing it that way at all. Um, I don't know, Sean. There's, um, well, what are some of the sites you want me to see? Well, um, I, I decided that because I was thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, we should get there and take off up north and go see the Barrier Reef and do all that stuff. No, I'm not going to do that anymore. I just want to sink into my hometown. It's very beautiful. And um, just sink into my family and friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think going – I just want to go and see the changes that have happened in Newcastle. I've heard there's beautiful bike paths, and they've made it very inviting and um, very touristy. Um, my brother will take us to places where tourists won't get to go. There's so many incredibly beautiful secret places that we'll go and see. But it will be, I mean, I know you even said, well, you know, there's not much culture in Australia. And I, I know, I, I get why you said that. Uh, you, but, you, you better have gotten, because I said it because I was teasing. I know, but there, well, it's just, it's very, it's going to be very unique from a cultural sense, because I would have seen, I'm going to notice the changes. Perhaps I won't like all of them, mm-hmm. but I decided it's just going to be a beachy, very hot, sun, sun-loving sun holiday. I don't, you know, I'm trying not to make too many plans. You say very really. hot. You say very hot. A lot of folks here in North America, we forget that Australia, or, or don't realize the difference is, the, the the geography they are Australia is down under, but what that means is that yes. the seasons are the exact opposite for us here in North America than they are for folks in the Southern Hemisphere. So when exactly. we when we'll, we'll be there December eighth to twenty eighth, which is Christmas time, which is winter for those of us here yes. in North America, but it'll be the middle of summer down there, won't it? 
That's right. What kind of temperatures are we looking at, uh, middle of summer-wise in Australia? Well, I've had Christmases. I remember Christmases at 42 degrees. Yay! Celsius. 42 (laughs) Celsius. Celsius. I know. Well, just as well they drink good beer, because that's what you do. You sit around and you drink good beer. Wait, 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 And there'll be wait, bowl, wait. bowls of are, cherries. Are you, are you saying Foster's is good beer? Oh, no, we're not going to drink that beer. They've got lots of good beer. Don't worry, we're not going to do the cheapy <laughs> Foster's and what was the other one? Chewy. We're not going to do all those. We're not going to drink those cheap ones. We'll drink. No. They've got so many nice beers. And there'll be bowls of cherries and watermelon and uh, barbecues and no more. I remember my grandmother still cooking, you know, doing her baked meat in the oven in 38 degrees. And we used to do this very (laughs) British Christmas when I was growing up. It was so ridiculous. And then suddenly, you know, things started to change and they started coming out with Christmas cards that that represented Australia and didn't have snow-covered houses with a big Santa Claus and a big <laughs> suit on it. And was like, oh, well, we have a different Christmas here than the, because we were so connected to all, all things British. So it's going to be, I don't know, I wonder, I just, I, I, I hope that you enjoy yourself. I don't know. So is, is there you a... Are, but you know, that's your responsibility. <laughs> is it, no, you're, you're supposed to be entertaining me. No, no, no. Your so, responsibility to have fun. Is is there a Australian version of Santa Claus, or do you have a whole different tradition when it comes to that kind oh, of stuff? Oh, there's even oh no, there's great. Um, well, it's Santa that he's in a pair of cutoffs and uh, <laughs> and, a, and a sleeveless t-shirt, and he's kind of casual. And there's actually children's books written now about about the Australian Santa. You know, it's all it's all it's absolutely. Firmly there now. It's not the guy in the big red suit anymore. No. I hope not. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I won't get you to play Santa when you're there. Yeah, no kidding. Want. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I won't. There's there's a couple of comments in the IRC chat room I want to get to. Uh, DH says, I've enjoyed the waters at Banff, both winter and summer. When he said that, I thought he was misspelling Banff, B-A-N-F-F. Oh. But there's a B-A-M-F-F in Australia. He says, but the bogey hole, or is it bogey hole? It's a bogey hole. Bogey hole, ocean pool, looks like high ice rolls in from the ocean. What does that mean? Oh, well, I don't know what he's... I'm sorry, what's the gentleman's name? D.H. Sorry, I don't know what you... I don't... I'm not quite sure. Like, is he talking about a certain part of the coast, I wonder? I'm yeah, not he, sure. He's talking about uh, the, the bogey hole. You don't know what the bogey hole is? Well, I've heard of the bogey, ho- bogey hole, but... Um, been a while. Bogey hole. All, <laughs> how about this? Bogey hole is also known as the com- Commandant's Baths. His heritage is listed sea bath in Newcastle. Thought to be the closest. Oh my gosh! The oldest surviving that, European yeah. construction in the city. That is so interesting that he mentions that because I was at the beach swimming yesterday here on the Sunshine Coast and um, Sunshine Coast Canada, not Sunshine Coast Australia. <laughs> And I was telling my friend about those those very baths. So that's amazing that 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 you're mentioning that DH. I think you said because they're beautiful. You know, a shark got stuck in those once when the tide came in. Because we've got there's a lot of ocean baths in Newcastle where it's like a big, huge public pool, but it's actually filled in by the tide, so it's salt water, of course. Okay, you you got to watch for the sharks. You. <laughs> <laughs> this is something we have discussed. We talked about it on the show yes. last week. You have, yes. in your lovely country, a remarkably <laughs> huge numbers of ways to die yes. from Which the wildlife. So overdone. Really? So you're yes. saying you don't have spiders that hide under toilet seats? Oh, it's all right. No, no. Don't worry. I'll come out. Oh no no! Uh, only when there were outdoor toilets. Now there are. We have we have sewage in Australia. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> we have flushing toilets. <laughs> so if you you know just you know I know you're going to check. Hell I yes! I, I'm going to listen and say listen, everyone. Sean's going to check under the toilet. <laughs> and no no, you're wrong. I'm sending you in to check first. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, I'll do it a couple times for you, and then you got to do it on your own. I do not. Be brave, Sean. Be I courageous. will not. I'll pee in the sink. <laughs> oh, you will not.
Scott. I will too. No, no, no. Don't do that. <laughs> Scott, Scott. Can you th- pee standing up? What's yeah, the exactly. Matter? So I can pee in the sink. Uh, no, Sc- just pee in the toilet. Scott Thrift says, Australian men have an unfortunate culture of being boof heads or boff heads. Get a few boof drinks. Heads, yeah. Boof heads? Okay. Get a few drinks in them and they suddenly become 10 feet tall and bulletproof. <laughs> Yes, Scott. Yeah, well, and other things, but yeah, oh, yeah. Dear. It is, I'm it, sorry, it, but they've earned their reputation. They have. I mean, it, it, it was brutal. It is. I used to ride my bike out of the way. I used to go blocks out of my way to avoid building sites. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I can understand that. Yes. It's, but it's not uncommon here in North America either. So uh, Australian men don't have a, a monopoly on being a holes. I've never, ever done it in Canada, ever. Really? Have I ever avoided it? Never. Interesting. Have I avoided a, a building site or anything like that? So they're, so, they're that much yes. worse in Australia. <laughs> yes, they are. For those folks who aren't familiar, Australia is its own continent. It has a population of 24 million, a little bit smaller than Canada. Physically, it's, <laughs> yes. it's smaller than Canada. They also, for those of our American friends who are not familiar with it, they they have a... Uh, similar style of government to we to those of us in Canada. They're part of the Commonwealth, yes. the former British colonies uh, from uh, from Great Britain, and they have a constitutional monarchy. What is yes. when you were there? I know it may have changed, but what are your thoughts personally and or as an Australian about the monarchy, about the British Queen and all that no, stuff? No, I'm not. No, uh, I'm not a. What is it, monarchist? Is that the right term? No, it's not something that interests me very much. So you don't you don't care, think, you don't care yeah. about the the British monarchy, the Queen, and the Prince Philip, and all those no, people. Uh, um, there were, I mean, growing up, there were many people. I mean, they, you know, it was a very popular thing when they came to visit and blah blah blah. No, for me, it's not really anything. I don't think about it too much. Not really. Interestingly enough, so, in uh, 1999, 55% of voters in a majority in every state rejected a proposal to become a republic yeah. with, with a president. So it does seem like the majority of Australians still, to one degree or another, still want the British monarchy as, as their nominal head of their country. Yes, well, perhaps if they did that, I don't know if that was a referendum or what they did, but um, perhaps if they do it in 10 years' time, it will be different. I don't know. Yeah Scott, yeah, Scott Thrift says, we will be a republic once Queen Liz dies. I wouldn't doubt that. I think a lot of yeah. us have this affection for... It's a loyalty to her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we certainly all... Um, we, yeah. We certainly, a lot of us have an affection for Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we, I think we also recognize that the rest of the family can be awfully messed up. I think the, yeah. I think the next generation might change that, but I think there, that's going to be the next time... A lot of these countries will do that referendum type thing and, be, and possibly become a republic. I don't think Canada ever will. I think we are closer, both physically but also culturally, to Britain. I don't think we will ever become a republic. I think we oh. kind of like our system here in Canada. There are people who are what we call anti-monarchists, but I don't think they're anywhere near even a sizable minority, let alone a majority yet. So that's interesting. You say that. Yeah. Would you, would you, <clears throat> no, I think. Mm-hmm. Would you agree or disagree with that? Do you, have you heard from Canadians that they uh, like or don't like the monarchy? No, it's not a question I ask people, or yeah. you know, it's not a discussion that comes up with me okay. or, or my friends. Or no, but I agree with Scott. I think people are being loyal to her. She's, you know, she's been around for so bloody long that you know, let's just wait till she croaks and then we'll change everything. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, so uh, we'll be in Newcastle. But we're also going to be going to Sydney, won't we? Yes. And you had a very, very funny uh, uh, thing you wanted to do um, in Sydney Harbour, which was tell tell the audience what you wanted to do in Sydney Harbour. What did I want to do in Sydney Harbour? With the bridge. I want to go to Luna Park. I have to go to Luna Park. We have to do that. With the bridge. Um. Well, I guess I'm not. No, I was just thinking we, we would climb up onto the top of the bridge. So, folks, you, you, you've all seen that wonderful, gorgeous uh, Sydney Bridge. Any any shot they have of Sydney Harbour will always show the Opera House and show that beautiful bridge. If you saw the um, any fireworks displays from down under, you'll see the fireworks are actually on the bridge. Gorgeous bridge. And you can actually do a walking tour on top of the bridge, on the outer 
spire of the bridge and walk up and over the top. Except it's $400. I know, crazy. And it takes three and a half hours. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of that freaking is so money. so long, isn't it? Three and a half hours. Well, apparently it's quite the hike. I mean, it's 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 quite the walk up up the uh, the outside of the bridge. But I, it doesn't matter. I, I I won't see it. I, I will not. I will not spend <laughs> that kind of money on walking up. Up there's no restaurant bridge. up there, or yeah, there's no, there's like nothing that. up there. Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> there's yeah. nothing up there. No interest. You know, like we don't even get to have a beer or anything. We just stand there and there's, look at the view. There only, must be incredible, though. There are only two things I want to do when I'm in Australia, and you have to promise me that we'll get to do them. All right. One well, thing is, first. I need <laughs> to get a good picture, what I consider to be a good picture, of the Sydney Opera House. Of course. And, yes. I, and, and, and I have to touch a koala bear. No, of course you I, will. I, I, no, no, no. I'm, yeah. I'm not just, I'm not talking about seeing one in a zoo. I have no, to be no, able no, to you want pet to touch a koala one. bear. All right. And maybe a wombat. I know where I'm going to take you. And a wombat. Or maybe. you have to, have to touch a wombat. Are, are, are wombats cuter than koala bears? They don't look cuter. Well, I, I kind of, I have a preference for wombats. You know, I like koala, but I, I, I have a preference for wombats. I really do. In, so, in, but, in, in your personal mm-hmm. life? Because <laughs> that could well, explain a I, lot. I, no. <laughs> well, how so? Well, with the, my with like the, of wombat. What in my life is reflecting my love of wombat? Well, with the menu date, they seem kind of wombatish. My which? What, what, seems, <laughs> what seems wombatish? The menu date. The menu date? Yes. The man I date. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, I have to think about that before I respond. <laughs> <laughs> you really okay. shouldn't have to think about that. <laughs> I, well, I do Jeez. have to think about it. I've never... <laughs> yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be, a, I'll reflect on it and I'll respond later. So th- there are and some, that, there are uh... some beautiful natural uh, sites in Australia, but unfortunately we won't get to any of them, will we? Except for the harbors in Newcastle and in Sydney. No, I disagree. No, no, no. Yes, we will. We'll get to sites that aren't, no, they're not, they won't be in the magazines or anything, but we'll see some beautiful things. I mean, part of it too, for me is that, you have an opportunity to take some incredible photographs. Like I'm looking forward to that part of it too. Well, that's the it's other the part. The photography part of it. Exactly. That's the other part that, that uh, I'm looking forward to. Hopefully we can pull this off. And if anyone in Australia can, can help out with this, l- l- let me know. Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. The idea is to teach my photography classes while I'm down there, either in Newcastle and or Sydney, Australia, and or Auckland and or Wellington, New Zealand. I'd love to be able to go down and teach the learn how to take better pictures with any camera and uh, the other class learn how to use your DSLR class. I'd love to be able to teach those classes down there in Australia. I think that would be a lot of fun. So if anyone's interested in the classes or if anyone is uh, knows of a place, the, the, the biggest thing is finding the people to go to the class, but also finding a place in Newcastle and in Sydney. And ideally, what we're looking for is a kind of a pub environment where they've got, you know, big screen TVs, but they've also got an area that's a, not closed off, but a little more private. Not a private room. I don't want a private room. I like the idea of being out in the middle of the pub kind of thing, but a pub space that seats 15, 20 people where we could have lunch, have a beer, do the classes. I think those would be uh, great spots to, to do that. Scott Thurst is also mentioning the Blue Mountains, uh, only an hour and a half train ride from the center yeah. of Sydney. What are the Blue Mountains? Yeah. You know, Scott, I haven't even been to the Blue Mountains. How bad is that? Wait, um, wait you've never been to the Blue Mountains? I haven't been to the Blue Mountains. You know, I, I lived in Sydney for a while, but I didn't I didn't go to the Blue Mountains. So Scott would know more about the Blue Mountains. There's, you know, there's the Three Sisters, which are famous in the Blue Mountains. I'm sure Scott will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're in the Blue Mountains. But but Just, the, the, it, that's very. But I mean, com- you're that's... you're Canadian. How uh, Canadian? A mountain in Canadian in a Canadian West Coast mind is very different to a mountain in, in an Australian. Yeah, but they're in blue. An Australian's mind. They're blue. They're covered in trees. So actually. they're green. But I think they must. Maybe they turn blue with a different. I don't know why they called the Blue Mountains. All right. All right. <laughs> um. 
Uh, Scott Thrift says no to touching the koalas. They've stopped it as it causes illness to the koalas. Son oh of a bitch. Oh, my gosh. Oh, jeez. Oh, thanks for you telling him, Scott, because now I don't have to, <laughs> to get there. He's always pre-prepared now. Exactly. <laughs> You're right. I would have been oh. pissed if I had gone there and said, no, they can't. you can't touch the koala bear. How about wombats? I wonder why you – yeah. Can we touch – Scott, can we touch – maybe I'll just go on the trip with Scott because he knows a lot more about Australia than you do. <laughs> he bloody lives there, doesn't he? <laughs> um. <laughs> Wonder why you can't wear a glove, a koala petting glove. Oh, that wouldn't be any fun. You want you want you want human to koala contact. You want a contact. sensory piece. Exactly. All right. If okay. I just want to wear gloves. I pet the cat. Well, you know, I think a wombat feels kind of maybe the same as a koala. I don't know. I'll buy you a koala stuffy. How's Scott, that? So, no, it's not the same as a real koala. God, you I completely know. missed the point of this. Oh my gosh. Um, Scott says the blue yeah. is from the eucalyptus haze in the summertime. Ah, thank you, Scott. You're right. The beautiful you you'll see the beautiful eucalyptus trees. That's where the koalas live. Gorgeous. Yeah, well, yeah. But <laughs> I can't could pet. Sneak a pet. We could sneak a pet. We'll just so we know we can do it away from everyone and go, Sean, quick. No, I'm, pet I'm, the koala. No, no, I'm Canadian. We wouldn't we wouldn't break the rules like that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, get out of the pool, right? Exactly. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the the joke Melissa is referring to is the old joke of how do you get how do you get ten Canadians out of a swimming pool? Canadians go to the swimming pool. That's all you got to do. <laughs> That's where we are that law abiding. We would actually go okay, and we would all get out of the pool. You're so law abiding, you're good law abiding citizens. We really, really are. Just <laughs> weird. Yes. Oh, oh, Scott says yes to touching wombats. Scott, okay, so how how are you with that? Like, you know, I know it's not the same, but they're well, pretty cute. I guess I'll be okay. Really? With, I guess I'll be okay with fondling a wombat. No, all right. I have no interest in seeing or touching a kangaroo. Is that right? Yeah, I never have. Well, why not? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I are don't. you worried they're going to punch you nope. or nope. kick you or something nope. or I, hit you with their big tail? I kick them back. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but no, it's one of the those. Wallabies ant- are cute. Yeah. Now I don't know what a wallaby looks like. I, I I often confuse wombats and wallabies, but they're 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 not the same. Wombats and wallabies. Yes. Yes. No, no. You should confuse kangaroos and wallabies. So, they're so the things that look more similar. A wallaby is like a small kangaroo. They're just a small kangaroo. They're quite lovely. They're much less intimidating than those great big kangaroos that look like they could beat you up in a boxing ring. You know, a lot of people don't real a lot of yeah. people don't realize that that a kangaroo can be like six feet tall and weigh they're several so hundred big. pounds. Yeah, they're massive. They're not they're not cute they're, little teeny yeah, tiny yeah. animals. They they are massive. They're massive. The, the wallabies are small though, so that they, they're much more. You might want to pet. I'm thinking you might want to pet. I want to pet a wallaby. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be funny. <laughs> so for you folks who are watching the uh, the video, uh, Scott Thrift has sent us a picture of a wallaby, and it does look like a small little miniature toy kangaroo. You're right. It, it, they do look cute. Oh. But yeah, I, you, it, I've never had much interest in, in kangaroos in, in general, so uh, no big deal. Huh. Looking, well, for, looking okay. forward to the beaches. You told me a lot about the beaches. They're, they're beautiful. Not because of the naked women. That's, that's not important. I mean, I have the internet if I want to see oh. naked if I want to see naked women, I've got I've got the internet, so I, I'm not worried about that. But um, we're both ocean people. You and I love the ocean, so yes. I'm looking forward yes. to swimming in the Pacific. So that's something I'm I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to the other aspect of this that I'm, it's going to be interesting. I think for you as well as me is is there any such thing as Australian food? Oh yes. Like, like what would be uh, what would be if you could think of one the uh, the Canadian sorry the Australian national dish? Is oh there, my is there gosh, such a thing? national dish. Ooh, Scott Thrift, well, help Scott, me out, Scott. Scott Thrift says Chico rolls. Oh my God, Scott Vegemite. Oh God, I kind of believe well, Okay, Vegemite is you know, disgusting. You're gonna, Vegemite is not disgusting. It's, Nobody knows how to serve it properly. I've, you don't Nobody gotta serve knows. it. I've had it. I've dipped my finger in a jar of Vegemite All and right. tasted it. You've it's disgusting. It. My grandmother could do magic things with Vegemite <laughs> that made her baked potatoes the best potatoes on the earth. She has a secret. I will tell you the secret. If you promise not to tell anyone else, I'll, I'll tell better, you what I'll, it is. I'll bet her secret is less Vegemite. 
Uh, no, 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 no. I'll tell you. It's, All right. What's it's, your, it's, what? it's tried and true. Okay. What's the um, you know, <clears throat> no, no, I'm not. I'm not going to say it because Scott will then tell all of the people that he knows. And oh, it's a big secret, right. okay. but you're going to love it because there's so much beautiful seafood. Yes, seafood, seafood, seafood. Yes, so, so, and then so, there's well, there's the good old Aussie meat pie, which I think probably still exists. That's British. Got to have though. a meat pie. That's British. No, no, no. Well, okay, yeah. What's a I chicken roll? Right. Oh. Oh, I can't. Oh, I, I wish Scott didn't use that as an example. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I don't really know. <laughs> okay. I remember when I was a kid, there used to be all these rumors about, you know, someone found a rat's leg in their chico roll. It's one of those <laughs> pieces of food <laughs> that always come with all these yucky rumors yeah. surrounding it about what's inside of your chico roll, you know. <laughs> What is really inside of a Chico roll? Okay, all right. That's the question. Moving on. Um, yeah, seafood is definitely something I'm, I'm looking for, and different seafood, too, because you guys don't have salmon, you don't have trout, you don't have the same kind of seafood that we have here in North America. We have salmon. Do you? I did, is there, is there uh, Australian salmon? I'm sure there is. I didn't know so that. I'm sure I asked my uncle. Scott, what, Scott, I says, we, Scott says no one knows what's in a Chico roll. That's the thrill. And he says we have trout. <laughs> I thought I thought trout was a I thought trout was a northern hemisphere fish. I didn't realize it was it had made its way down south. No, are you meaning trout or salmon? Trout. Oh, I don't know about trout. I don't. I don't. You don't know a lot about Australia, do you? Are you really Australian? Well, I don't. I've lived here longer than what I lived in Australia. I don't even. Who am I? Like, what, where, where, where do I belong? <laughs> You're a woman, a woman without a country. Now, the other thing that folks don't I'm, realize is that we are not going to Australia with just you and I, are we? No. No, we're not. We are going with? We're going with my son, Rory, who hasn't been yet. None of the family has met him yet. And, how, and, and, he's, and, how, and his best friend. And how mm -hmm. old is Rory? He'll, he'll be 12 when we go. He's and nearly 12. Old, his best friend's name is? Jasper and Jasper is he's coming along because uh, they're so close they're like brothers and his family agreed that he can come with us and he's nine he's kind of crazy too so it'll be interesting so you're going to go we're, we're one of the best parts about this trip is that you are leaving with them separate from me Yes. So you're going to I'm be flying. You're going to be flying with a 12 year old and a hyperactive nine year old. Oh well, I'll drug him if I have to. <laughs> well, yeah, I, think, I think baby Xanax <laughs> is definitely, definitely yeah, yeah. called for because it's a long yeah, so flight. This. I've done well. I've done it with a two year old. Yeah. But but for yeah. me, it's going to be from Vancouver to Hong Kong, which is going to be 15 hours, and then Hong Kong to Sydney, which is nine hours. After a three-hour layover yes. in Hong Kong, the weirdest part about all this, because of the international dateline and all that kind of weird, funky stuff, on the way back. So I'll leave here on December eighth, but not get to Sydney until December tenth. So time-wise, <laughs> it feels like a two-day trip, but it won't be a two-day trip; it'll be a one-day trip. But on the reverse yes. side, I will leave Sydney at approximately noon on Sunday, December twenty-eighth. Get to Hong Kong on on December 29th and then get to Vancouver <laughs> at noon on December 28th. I will get to Vancouver the same time I left Sydney. That is just so weird. <clears throat> Isn't it ever? It's no, so, no, no, so no. strange. Yeah. All right, we have to let you go. I want to say thanks very much to Melissa for being on the show. Thank you for doing this. I know you were very, very nervous and you were scared <laughs> of how mean I was going to be to you and how cruel oh, I was yeah. going to be to you. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and hopefully we will hear you on the show again very, very soon. I'm hugely, so nice. hugely excited about going on this trip, not just for the photography stuff, but not just for the uh, trip to uh, trip of a lifetime to Australia, a country I've never really wanted to go to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe. I'm astonished that you actually said that to me. But anyhow, go on. <laughs> but I'm really excited well, to I've go. I've never really wanted to go. Like, I'm sorry, but ticket book. Well, you know, I've never really ever wanted to go. Like, in the top 10 countries that I've ever wanted to visit, Australia isn't even in the top 10. Like, but you said that to me after the ticket was booked, Sean. Anyhow, I digress. 
It's it was lovely to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, hopefully we'll see Melissa on again very, very soon. Melissa, thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Folks, when we come back, we're going to be talking to Mike Bombich. Don't hang up right away. Oh, man, she's such a rookie at this stuff. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Mike Bombich of Bombich Software about carbon copy cloner, all that, and much more coming up. This is your Mac Life. Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am Sean King. Now on our phone, we've got our friend uh, Mike Bombick. I've been correcting him this pronunciation of his name from Carbon Copy Cloner. Sorry, from BombickSoftware.com, the developer of Carbon Copy Cloner version 5, which is now available on the website Bombick.com. Mike, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing really good. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you very much for joining us. You and I, I don't even know if you remember, you probably don't, but I think I interviewed you about 10 years ago when one of the early versions of Carbon Copy Cloner was available. You were still working at our favorite fruit company at the time and kind of doing <laughs> Bombit Software and CCC um, on the side kind of thing, weren't you? Yeah, I remember that interview. That was Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, man. <laughs> So yeah. what made you, were you fired from our favorite fruit company? Did you leave on your own volition? Is it, is, <laughs> is Bombic software now your full-time gig? Give us a sense of uh, where, where you are in your life right now. Yeah, sure. So I worked for Apple for eight years and uh, it was, it was a great time for me, you know, right out of college, uh, right out of grad school. And uh, uh, you know, for eight years I did a lot of field work, a lot of travel, and uh, it was actually when my daughter was born that I knew it was time to give it up. So that's when I left Apple. It was on my own volition. And, you know, I, I just wanted to go out and, and make great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I felt, ironically, that I couldn't do at Apple was be really creative and uh, develop solutions. And I had been developing CCC for a really long time, and it had a great following. So I... I jumped out of that perfectly functional airplane <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, went for it. And it's been fantastic. You know, I really have poured my heart and my soul into the product and it has been a lot of fun, which, you know, not a lot of people can say that about their work. Yeah. Um, it's been a lot of fun and it's, it's been fruitful for us. For those folks who are unfamiliar with Carbon Copy Cloner, uh, give us the, the elevator pitch as to what it is and what it does. Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of people use their computer day by day and uh, they, they don't realize that, um, you know, there's that spinning hard drive in the older ones and even in the SSDs, there's a piece of hardware that could just suddenly fail. <laughs> and, you know, if you just use your computer for checking email, 
not really a big deal. You can head down to the Apple store and get it taken care of. But, you know, if you're like a lot of people, photographers and, and researchers, um, you know, you use it for production and any downtime is really going to cause you some trouble. Yeah. Uh, it's not just the fact that you're, you're dealing with, you know, technical stuff that you're not familiar with, uh, but you're, you're down without your computer. So what CCC does is it makes a backup of your, uh, your hard drive onto an external hard drive. And if your hard drive in your Mac ever fails, you can just boot from that backup volume and just in a couple minutes you'll be back up and running, open up your email, your documents, and, and get back to work right away. How is this different and or better, and I certainly believe it is better, than what folks may already have set up on their Mac through Time Machine? Yeah, so obviously Time Machine comes with the Mac and you get it for free. Um, the big difference between CCC and Time Machine is that you have to restore a Time Machine backup before you can get back to work. Yes. So if your Mac hard drive dies, you got to run out to the Apple store or you know your local computer hardware store and get a replacement hard drive, replace it, or just take your Mac to the Apple store and have them replace it, and then restore your data, and then you're back up and working. But with a CCC backup, you know, you just attach it to your Mac and boot from it, and you're up and running in just a couple minutes. It's a lot so, faster. You know, Have, both, having had to do that on, on, on occasions both with um, – that I've used and liked, uh, it is much, much faster with Carbon Copy Cloner. It's a lot less stressful to do that through because i found over the years time machine just i don't trust time machine i've never had a problem with the four or five times i've had bad crashes or or bad issues i've never had a problem with carbon copy cloner i have had a couple of issues with time machine enough of them to make me just go eh, i'm not trusting time machine is my only backup solution if you've got it and you use it and it's free from from apple go ahead and, and do a time machine backup but I also tell folks to have another backup, too. Having just one backup isn't really a backup. If something happens to that time machine backup, you're screwed. You want to have at least two separate backups, correct? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And and it's not necessarily just having separate solutions, but having uh, disparate hardware. You know, the, the whole reason for making a backup is that one piece of hardware could fail. Yes. And the second piece of hardware could fail, too. Uh, they all have moving parts, and you know you knock it around a little bit. My <laughs> my own production backup disk uh, just tumbled off the the desk the other day, <laughs> and uh, I've taken it out of rotation uh -huh. <laughs> because I need to put it through some tests. It was the, at, at the absolute worst moment. It was like right on Friday, yeah. and you know it was the the day after we shipped the new product. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm just going <laughs> to set it aside, get one of my other discs. Yep. But, you know, it's funny because I've had to rely on the, the solution myself yep. just a couple times where I've had a hard drive failure or left my laptop somewhere. And when I get up and running on it, I just kind of look like, wow, that was really incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I did this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But the other great thing about Carbon Copy Cloner, the, one of the another reasons why I've recommended it over the years, is that it's so simple to use. You guys have done a lot of work, and even on the new version, I was really impressed with seeing all these tips that popped up to that walked me through the process. So even if you've never used Carbon Copy Cloner before, version 5 is, and this I, I think is new in version 5. I don't think I remember seeing it in, in other versions. Even if you've never used the app before, it will get you doing a backup very, very simply and very, very quickly. Is this is this new in, in 5? Yeah, so that was actually a feature that I wanted to put into version 4. And when we've been working with the, uh, the UI engineers for our complete overhaul of version 4, we just never got that worked in there. Mm, okay. And I was a little frustrated about that. And I got to give a shout out to my uh, the other developer on my team, Peter. Uh, one day, he just came up with these bubble tips. And uh, we were kicking them around a little bit, and I was tweaking them and getting them looking just right. And then one day I realized, ah, this is exactly what I need yeah. for the guided setup that I wanted to do. So, and the moment that I did guided setup, you know, I just had an epiphany. You know, when you boot from your backup, I can figure out if you're booted from the backup, and I can pop CCC open and say, hey, look it, it looks like you're booted from your backup. Do you need help going through a restore? Yeah. So, you know, very quickly we put that together and it's, it's one of my 
favorite features of CCC5. And, you know, I, I build a lot of features in there for the power users, and they're going to shut this off right away. But we get so much feedback from people, um, just really basic questions. You know, I, I'm supposed to back up to an external hard drive, and that really grounds you, and you realize that there's a lot of people out there that do need that extra hand holding. Yep, that's right. So that's I right. was so excited to be able to deliver that. It's 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 a really big deal because very much like security, uh, passwords, privacy, doing backups is one of those things you you absolutely must do. I've always said, you know, there's there's that old old cliche that there's two kinds of people: those who have had hard drive crashes and those who will have hard drive <laughs> crashes. A hard drive is a physical yeah. object. It is going to break at some point in time, and you cannot predict when it's going to break, except for the fact I can predict it'll break at the worst possible time. I <laughs> guarantee you, when your hard drive crashes, it's just before that term paper has to be done, just before that office report has to be done, just before your Mac life starts. That's when your hard drive will, yeah. will, will crash on you. And if you need to take a couple of hours to do a backup and restore, well, that's not good. If you can just boot from your external drive and have everything look the exact same as it did a few moments or a few hours ago and you're up and running instantly, that's a whole lot better than trying to futz around with trying to restore files or things like that. And again, Carbon Copy Cloner walks, them, walks the beginner through this process. I was really impressed with... It telling me that when I uh, when I chose that I didn't I, when I first got the app I, I I did a backup just to see how it looked I loved the tips <clears throat> and I told it to not do a recovery hard drive partition for me and it very clearly and this is the big deal for me it very clearly explained to me why I should want to do that but it didn't force me to do it so if you're a pro if you're a grizzled mm -hmm. old veteran and you know how to do this stuff you can easily skip through this. But if you're a beginner, you can read that tip and go, oh, so I'm, I'm looking at the, the, uh, the uh, cloning coach. It pops up right here. It says, if you intend to use the destination volume as a primary startup disk, you should create a recovery HD partition on that disk. That's very clear. That's very easy for the average user to figure this stuff out. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering back to the days of retrospect and doing things on tape drives and the, the absolute awful <laughs> UI those things had, and you had no idea whether or not these things were going to work. So I really appreciate how simple and easy Carbon Copy, Carbon Copy Cloner is for that beginner. Us pros know how to do this stuff. It's real easy for a pro to do this stuff, but for a beginner, my, this, this is very intimidating, and you've got, you guys seem to have done a really good job of taking that intimidation factor away. Thank you. The, let's talk about some of the other new features of Carbon Copy Cloner 5. Uh, we've talked about the guided setup and the guided restore, which are very important. Like I said, I love the, the tips that you've got set up there. Tell me more about this cloning coach. I love your description of you personally in the, um, the About Us page on Carbon <laughs> Copy Cloner. I did not know this. Mike, Mike uh, says that uh, he, he is, as, and as an identical twin, Mike was a clone from birth. You think that's where all this started, Mike? Is it because you were a clone? <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could, especially <laughs> weeks like this. But, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I feel a lot of support requests, and uh, it's Rob and I that, that typically man the support desk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see the questions that come in, and we see the errors that people run into. And every time I give somebody advice, well, gee, you, about, you should probably restart that NAS device or something like that. Yeah. I think how can I put this right in there when that error occurs yep. to say, hey, this happened, and usually when this happens, you should try this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, proactively, hey, it looks like you chose this configuration. People tend to have trouble with that, or, you know, this might not work, and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So, and there's so many of those things. I mean, the logic for the, the cloning coach alone is, is just huge, yeah. and I'm constantly tweaking it. Um, but yeah, the other thing that I really like in version five is task grouping. And we got a lot of feedback about that. The funny thing about developing a product, you know, you have your own idea about how people will use it and then you put it out there and people use it in just completely different ways. <laughs> and, you know, every once in a while I, I'll get, um, you know, a report and somebody's like, uh, the, um, the source and destination selector, I can't see all my discs because I have 64 discs. Yeah. Or, and we fixed that one long ago, or, um, you know, you get a ticket and somebody's got, you know, 97 tasks 
And that one blew, just blows me away. Um, but, you know, we got enough of those that we realized uh, what we really need to spend some time on is task organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, within CCT4, we had a, a feature called task chaining where you could uh, chain tasks together. So if you had, you know, multiple hard drives and you wanted to run the task sequentially, you could chain them. Well, with task groups, that's kind of implicit. You order the tasks within the group, and then the group will run them. All you have to do is, is you know, add the, the tasks to the group. Okay. So that's my second favorite feature of, of CCC5. I noticed, uh, again, uh, and then the last. Sorry, go ahead. The, the last one is actually relevant for some uh, potential crash plan customers out there. <laughs> um, we've done a lot of work in <laughs> the uh, uh, backing up to a remote. Uh, Macintosh, um, the setup for that is far simpler. So if you've got another Macintosh on your network or, or even across the network or across the Internet that you have access to, uh, you could back up to that. Explain what Smarter Safety Net is or Smart Safety Net in general is. Boy, we got a lot of feedback on this one. Um, so the, first of all, the Safety Net uh, is exactly that. Uh, it's something that you know catches stuff that might otherwise fall to its doom. Um, if you've got data on the backup disk um, or whatever disk you choose as the destination and then you run the task, CCC won't immediately delete stuff. Okay. Uh, instead, what it'll do, if, if there's something that's not on the source and it's on the destination, that stuff gets put into the safety net. And that's been huge because we get a lot of people, they don't you know, realize how it works or what it's going to do, uh, or they just pick the wrong disk and you know they click the button and suddenly, poof, stuff is gone. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's not gone, it's in the safety net. Yeah. So that's been great. Um, but what happens is CCC will, uh, will keep adding stuff to the safety net, and it does have settings to prune, uh, but it's kind of manual tuning for the pruning. Mm -hmm. You know, the default settings work for most people, but for a lot of people, uh, they were finding that the destination would fill up. Uh, so what we've done in CCC5 is um, we'll, we'll watch the task as it's running, and if the destination fills up, we're going to tweak that pruning limit automatically go back, print some more, and then go through the task again. Okay. And we'll do that as many times as we need to so that the task can actually complete. So we want the safety net to be helpful, but we don't want it to be a hindrance to your regular backups. That's the other thing uh, uh, folks may not realize that they can and should do with this kind of software is this idea of regular automated backups. One of the things I recommend for the, the, the tech support folks out there, if you're your family's tech support, is – set these kinds of softwares software up to do it automatically so your mom your dad your little brother whoever who is not tech savvy carbon copy cloner allows you to install this stuff on on their computers and have it backed up automatically over a network or to an external hard drive so they don't have to worry about it and then every day at 3 a.m for example it can do a backup of your mom's computer that way you don't got to worry about any of this stuff happening, you don't have to worry about reminding your mom to do it, or even for your own self. Uh, I do my backups <clears throat> every day at 3 a.m. I'm, like, I'm not using my computer. I'm, I'm bed asleep, and it does all this stuff behind the scenes and does it as, as, a, as a, uh, uh, a task in the evenings. The other thing that folks may not realize, and I've seen this question before, so say they've got 100 gigabytes of data on their hard drive, your Carbon Copy Cloner or any good backup software doesn't back up 100 gigabytes every single time. Explain to folks what Carbon Copy Cloner does do every single time. Yeah, it does a smart backup. So basically what it does is it, it compares the items on the source and the destination. And if there's already something on the destination uh, from a previous backup and it's already up to date, I'm not going to copy it again. Yeah. Uh, I'll copy just the differences. Uh, the one exception to that is uh, we've got the, these new backup health checks, uh, and it's not entirely new. We've had this functionality in there before, uh, but we've improved it in CCC5. And what that will do is every you know, week or month, depending on how you've uh, configured it, it will reread every file on the source and the destination. And the reason it does that is because uh, as the data sits there on the hard drive, uh, the met, I don't I'm probably going to say this wrong, but like the magnetic charge uh, can actually start to wane. Sure. And over time, uh, the, the sector will be difficult to read. Mm -hmm. If you periodically reread everything on the disk, the disk's firmware 
will actually rewrite sectors where it's gotten the message that, you know, there's low magnetic charge. Wow. Uh, so we'll automatically fix any potentially uh, failing data. The other thing that it does is it finds and failed sectors. So sometimes sectors just fail. Yep. And if a sector has failed on the destination, CCC can automatically replace that file. Now, if the sector failed on the source, uh, CCC is not going to do anything to the file that already exists on the destination, but it's going to give you an error and say, uh, you know, you need to recover this file from the backup. So CCC will tell me that the file on the source drive is possibly corrupted and tells me to restore it or to recreate it or something along those lines? Exactly. If the, if the file cannot be read from the source due to a, a physical hard drive problem, uh, CCC will actually skip past that file, copy as many other files as possible. At the end, it'll loop back and try again to copy that file because statistically speaking, it's, it's sometimes possible to get that data on a second read. Yeah. Uh, but then if it still fails, it'll pop up a message at the very end and give you a list of all the files that couldn't be copied. Interesting. I didn't realize that. So it, it basically it won't copy over bad files. It won't replace it, bad files with good files that are on your backup drive. That's correct. Wow, and cool. if you've got a, a good file on the backup, which hopefully you do because you make regular backups, yeah. uh, then you can just quickly recover that file from the backup if it's failed on the source. Now, one of the things that uh, I hated and turned off as soon as I could on Time Machine was the idea of do these hourly backups. Because I found out, and maybe it changed since then, but when I first started using Time Machine on the Macintosh, I found once an hour when I did the backup, my laptop my iMac would just bog down I knew when it was the top of the hour because I could feel my laptop slowing down does first of all does carbon copy cloner do those kinds of hourly timed backups and if it does what kind of performance hit am I looking at you're, you're going to see a performance hit anytime we're, we're doing reads on on your source disk or your destination disk yes uh, CCC does have hourly options and, you know, it's, it's like any medical advice. You know, there's things that you can do, um, but you don't necessarily need to do it. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to personal preference, and it, it comes down to specific files. You know, if there's work that you do, and, you know, if you find yourself going throughout the day and you just stop and think, what if I lost my last hour's work? Yeah. How devastating would that be? For me, it'd be huge. Yeah. So what I do is I have a work-in-progress folder my developer folder, I back that up hourly. Okay. And it gets through that pretty quickly because it's not my whole hard drive. Yeah, yeah. But then at the end of the day, 5.30, I've got a, a task that will go through everything and get everything up to date. So at any one time, you know, I've got, uh, you know, an hour of my most important stuff and my whole backup is less than 24 hours old. So if you're organized, you can be very specific as to what you allow Carbon Copy Cloner to back up on an hourly basis, on a 12-hour basis, on a monthly basis kind of thing, correct? Exactly. And that's why we have the, the ability to add multiple tasks. Within yeah. each task, you can define what gets backed up and what's excluded. Yeah. Now, one of our listeners uh, sent me an email, and I'm not knowing the ins and outs of this. You're going to have to walk me through the answer to the questions from our friend Scott Randall on the Long Island Macintosh user group. Uh, I read uh, Michael Bombich's post pointing out that you should not do the upgrade with the new Apple file system. He recommends staying with HFS Plus until the bugs in APFS are sorted out and fixed. Since he's a developer working with the new file system, I would take his advice and not adopt it too soon. Is that true? Is that what you what, what you recommending? That is what I recommended uh, about a month ago. But as we all know, Apple is constantly evolving. <laughs> and Monday, we learned <laughs> that that may not actually be HOA. Um, yes. So, and I, I, I do. I'm glad he brought this up because I, I definitely wanted to touch on this. Um, I don't want anyone to get the impression that I think APFS is bad. I think APFS is an awesome new file system. Yes. And I'm really looking forward to playing with all of the new features and looking forward to a, a more robust modern file system. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm cautioning people against is, you know, being the fanboy and jumping right into it full on on your production system. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems like common sense. <laughs> if you use your Mac, 
for doing work. I mean, if your business relies on it or something like that, there's absolutely no reason to run out and, and download that new OS the moment it comes out. Yep. Give it a few months. It's like any software. You know, we found a, a dozen bugs or so just in the first week here, and yep. we've been cranking out fixes for it. Anytime that you go from, you know, a, a beta test of like dozens or hundreds of users to production when you've got like a million users or, yep. you know, a hundred million users, you're going to find those edge cases. <laughs> and, you know, do you want to be the person who runs into that edge case that they hadn't yet figured out and have it such that your Mac doesn't boot yeah. or, you know, the, you get hard drive or file system corruption or anything, anything could happen. So just let common sense prevail. Just what? give it a, a couple months before you dive in and then you know, read the reports. And at that point, I'm, I'm sure we'll be on much better footing. What Mike is saying is that Apple just announced, not announced, but they put out a, a note that said on Monday that said this new file system, which everyone agrees, as Mike said, is going to be a very, very good file system. It's going to be a great way. For the average user, you won't notice very much, except when you install macOS High Sierra and you have a SSD drive, a solid state drive, Apple is going to switch that drive permanently over to this APFS system. You'll have a choice to do it on your physical hard drive, but when it comes to the SSD drives, it's going to flip to APFS, and you have no option. If you want to install High Sierra, you have to do this to your SSD drives. And the problem is we don't know how that's going to affect other software. We don't know how it's going to affect um, uh, Final Cut Pro. We don't know how it's going to affect... Photoshop. We don't know how it's going to affect you working with files that are saved on a physical hard drive that you then want to move over to an SSD drive. We don't know. Until it actually comes out, <clears throat> we don't know this stuff. So what I'm doing and what Mike is suggesting, what everyone with half a brain suggests, is that if you're using your machine to make money, if it's a business machine, do not install, no matter how much of a temptation it is, do not install High Sierra until you know what's going to happen with your SSD drives and your hard drives. If you've got a backup machine, if you've got, I've got a, a MacBook Air back here, and the day of of High Sierra availability, I will back that machine up using Carbon Copy Cloner, and I'll install the hell out of Mac OS 11 out of, out of, out of High Sierra. <laughs> Don't care because it's, it's a backup machine. But this machine I'm looking at, my iMac, my 27 inch beloved iMac, no freaking way is High Sierra getting on this machine until I know for a fact that everything I rely on, Carbon Copy Cloner and Lightroom and Wirecast and all that stuff is going to work with this new file system. Because if it doesn't work, you're screwed because this is a permanent change to the way your SSD drive will work. So that's a big, big deal. So tread carefully, folks, when it comes to High Sierra and this new APFS system. Yeah, just one comment uh, adding on to that. Um, the, so I've actually got an article in my K-Base, uh, Best Practices for Upgrading Your OS, Good. Uh, that people should check out before they, they upgrade. Um, but the one point I make in there that's really important for people to understand, uh, if you make a backup of Sierra, for example, unplug it from your Mac, set it aside, then do your upgrade. Um, but what happens next is really important. If you ever want to downgrade back to, to Sierra, it's, it's super simple to just erase your hard drive and go back. Yeah. Uh, but if you, push that decision off a week, a month, things start to get a little bit hairier because any the Apple applications that you use on High Sierra, they're going to upgrade all of the data stores uh, that came over from Sierra. Yeah. And that is not a backwards compatible upgrade. So mail, calendar, address book, all of those applications uh, on High Sierra, you know, anything, any changes that you make on High Sierra, you're not going to get those back. Uh, if you ever decide that you need to go back to Sierra because, ah, something's not working or whatever, yep. uh, you need to make that decision sooner than later. Yeah. So definitely go into it with a full bootable backup. Definitely detach that bootable backup from your Mac. Uh, but then, you know, play around quickly, test out all of your apps, and, and make sure that you're ready to commit to High Sierra. I hadn't thought about the idea of uh, actually physically removing that bootable backup from <laughs> From the system, yeah, it hadn't hadn't occurred to me, but that's a good tip, folks. You can go to Carbon Copy Cloner, 
Uh, you can go to bombic.com. It's in the help section. Just do a site search for best practices. I popped it up. I've sent it to the IRC chat room. It's called Best Practices for Updating Your Macs OS. And has that been updated for uh, Sierra? Hi, Sierra. Will it be updated, or is this pretty much a standalone app all by itself? Sorry, standalone well, article. So as you know, as as all of this stuff is still evolving, uh, a lot of the things that are specific to High Sierra, I'm holding off on documenting until we get a GM in hand. Yeah. Uh, I got a lot of stuff queued up. Um, I did make that one article, everything that you need to know about carbon copy cloner and APFS. Uh, and I, sure enough, the moment I published that, <laughs> Apple changed something. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. Uh, you know, a lot of people are really curious about that, so that one I felt important to publish. But I will have a lot more documentation uh, specific to High Sierra uh, once we get a GM in hand. That's something a lot of folks don't realize, and maybe you can give us some, some of the developer uh, insight into this. There's a public beta. There's been, there have been developer betas out for a while now, uh, public beta. People get upset at companies who the day High Sierra is available and downloadable, they get upset at companies like you who say who they can't download the latest version the day of High Sierra. Well, you've had the developer preview for as long as I have. You've had the public beta as long as I have. Why isn't your software ready when Apple software is ready? Yeah. Wow. I find I find that really frustrating. Yeah. And I, I get where people are coming from. But, you know, ask me to build a house in three months. <laughs> mm, not going to happen. Yeah. Um, yes, we got access to it in June. And what we got access to was painfully slow and you know, there's bugs in it and yep. naturally they want us to, uh, to find those bugs and report them. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of our time testing our own software within that environment um, and finding our own bugs. But we're also dealing with uh, issues within the new file system, within the new operating system. Yep. And you know, it's not like the moment you install it, it's like, Oh, that's a bug. You know, you're tripping over stuff and things are, are not working or you're looking at a spinning cursor. So we spend a lot of time, um, you know, trying to come up with a reproducible test case, reporting bugs and things like that. Yep. And usually, like, finally, we're starting to see some pretty good quality betas. And uh, a lot of the bugs that we've been reporting have been resolved. So finally, at, you know, we're probably just a month out, if that, um, we're finally getting a uh, some builds that we can do some final qualification tests against. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and still, it's not until that GM ships where I can say, you know, in writing, I expect this to work, uh, this won't work, and, you know, you can do this using this procedure, and I can expect that procedure to not change. Uh, so, you know, we do a lot of testing all summer long, but it really is at that last GM that uh, we pull out all the stops and start writing the uh, expectations. Monty in our IRC chat room says, because development takes time, sit down and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's exactly it. People don't realize that, yes, you've had the public beta as long as, as I've had it, as long as the other average users have had it, but that doesn't mean that your software works with it or that it works with your software. Even after Apple does the last public beta to the point where it's what they call golden master, as, as Mike said, GM, there might be changes made in there. Some of those changes might be drastic. There might be so much that it breaks software that come, that is available. As a matter of fact, yeah, that actually happened in Sierra. Yep. There was a, uh, an issue that I ran into with disk images. And at the very last GM, all of a sudden I was running into this nasty stall yep. and I rescued that one at the very last moment. Um, but yeah, it it can change right up to the end. And especially with software like Carbon Copy Cloner, which works at the file system level. This is not an application that sits on top of the things in the sandbox and does its own little thing up in the corner. You're working at the OS level. So it's very, very important that your software works with it because the last thing in the world you guys want to do is hi Sierra comes out, people do backups and they find out that it deletes your backup or destroys your hard drive or, or any other nightmare scenarios that are certainly possible when it comes to the kind of software that carbon copy cloner is correct. Yeah. And you know, we, we make a bootable backup and in order to make a bootable backup, we really have to know a lot about how the operating system works. Yeah. That's probably our biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's not just that the operating system is changing year by year, but 
You know, you've got new USB and Thunderbolt hardware that comes along, and it's constantly changing. So we're constantly trying to figure out what devices, you know, are bootable, what what doesn't work, what hubs cause problems, yeah. what antivirus software causes problems. So yeah, we we live on the OS, and we you know we live and die by those OS changes. Brings up a question: Is is that? I guess the, it's the wrong word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Is are those kind of changes fun for you guys? Does this make it more exciting for you, or are you just pulling your hair, out going, "Okay, Apple, stop, stop making changes"? Or is do you guys like the challenge of these changes? Uh, I kind of want to answer that both ways. I mean, sometimes <laughs> I, I, you know, when I first started using computers in college, I remember this back in 1995. I remember the day that I was struggling with like a Microsoft Word problem. And I looked at that thing and I said, I am not going to let a computer defeat me. (laughs) And (laughs) I've been defeated plenty of times, believe me. (laughs) But I do. I love the challenge. Um, I love digging into a technical issue and then finally coming up on on the upside and and beating it and, and putting a nice, friendly face on it. And, you know, like with the Recovery HD, that is a perfect example. Yeah. That took so much engineering work. And I, you know, over the years, I narrowed it down to a single button. And I find that just absolutely <laughs> satisfying. So it's, it's the problems that you can't solve that are frustrating as opposed to the ones that you can. <clears throat> yes. Which makes yes. perfect sense. And those are the ones that file the bug and, and hope they fix it. It's been a joy using your software over all these years. It's always been nice talking to you and, and, and seeing the comments, the wonderful comments that folks have talked about when it comes to Carbon Copy Cloner. It is a very, very good piece of software. It has been from the very beginning. I can't remember any major problems with Carbon Copy Cloner. And that's important to say that because, as we just said, you are working at the basic file level system of our hard drives. That if Carbon Copy Cloner screws up on my backup, I'm screwed. I don't ever want to be able to go to have a hard drive crash or or a system crash and go to Carbon Copy Cloner and have it go, sorry, can't help you. That's the worst thing in the world. I have had had that happen with Time Machine. So like I said, I don't trust Time Machine. I trust Carbon Copy Cloner. So folks, whatever that's worth to you, take that to heart. You can go to the website, Bombic. Dot com and you can do a search for or not search it'll be right there at the top and you can check out carbon copy cloner there is a a three day uh, 30 day free trial of the software isn't there yep completely unlimited download it in fact i encourage people to download it and try it uh, just you know everybody's looking for a different solution so take it for a spin full 30 days and see if you like it it is uh, not only do uh, do a backup but if you'd like um, It'll let you do uh, the, 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 the trial software will let you do a bootable backup and give that a try too. Yeah. Do, a, do a backup, uh, a, a bootable backup, then boot from that backup to test to see if the software works the way you want it to work. I can almost guarantee you that you're going to love the user interface. The user interface of Carbon Copy Cloner is real simple, really easy, easy to use. That's what's important to me that it's easy to figure this stuff out. That if I have to explain something over the phone to somebody, it's very easy to point them in the right direction. I'm always, I've always been impressed with you guys' user interface. And again, I come from the days of retrospect, so maybe, maybe I'm biased. <laughs> but <laughs> for those of them, I know Monty, uh, uh, I gave him a fright when I said the word retrospect because he rem- remembers how awful, awful that software was. And, and so the, the lovely UI of, Carbon Copy Cloner is a big deal. Folks, uh, Mike has kindly offered to give away a copy of Carbon Copy Cloner. We're going to do that on next week's show. Uh, send in your entry form. You go to the website at yourmaclifeshow.com. Right there at the top of the page, you can click on the entry form. Send me an email. I'll drop your name into the virtual hat, and you have a chance to win version 5 of Carbon Copy Cloner on next week's show. If you're a subscriber to Your Mac Life, don't worry about it. You're already going to be entered into the contest automatically mike bombic of bombic software uh, i really appreciate you taking all this time to explain this stuff to us and uh, congratulations on carbon cloner carbon copy cloner five and i wish you much success in the future thanks mike thank you very much have a good night bye-bye Bye, folks if you have any questions uh the, the folks at um, bombic software are really good the, they're um it's so typical of 
these kind of small Macintosh companies that have uh, wonderful tech support, personalized tech support. It's not a big company off doing things. You're talking to Mike. You're talking to his brother. You're talking to his wife. You're talking to friends and family. And uh, they're very, very helpful. The great thing about Carbon Copy Cloner is that you really need any kind of serious tech support. You may need some help on how to do this or how to do that, and their knowledge base on their website is very, very good for finding that information. Their search is great. The two articles I linked to in the IRC chat room about best practices and everything you need to know were both easily found on their site search website, so the website is, is, uh, is very good too. Monty says, sounds like it's time for me to install this and give it a serious look. Uh, my OSs are a bit older. Is CCC5 backwards compatible? DH, I wish you'd ask that when Mike was here because I could have asked that question. What you can do is go to bombic.com and uh, ask them that question. I, I think it is. I don't know. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. I'm looking at the website now. It says system requirements. So let me see what the system requirements for uh, CCC5 requires Yosemite 10.1 and above. So if your system is Yosemite, El Capitan, Sierra, or High Sierra, otherwise, if you want to go back to Mountain Lion, uh, CCC4 works th with Mountain Lion and up. So hopefully that uh, will help out a little bit. Um, you can go to, again, go to the website, bombic, B-O-M-B-I-C-H dot com. Uh, do a search right there on the site. You can download a copy of CCC5 free, 30 days, can't hurt. Might as well give it a try and see if you like the software. We've run out of time. I'm going to do the uh, raw um, discussion on next week's show. We'll hopefully, we'll have Jim Dalrymple back on the show next week. I want to say, again, thanks to uh, Mike Bombick and the uh, folks at Bombick Software. Um, don't forget to send in your entry form. Uh, again, go to the website, yourmaclifeshow.com. Right there at the top of the page, you'll see uh, Friends of YML entry form. Fill that entry form out. That sends it off to me. I'll drop your name into a virtual hat. And our next week's show, we'll do a drawing for not, not only Carbon Copy Cloner 5, but we're also going to do a draw for The Curve from the nice folks at 12 South at 12South.com. If you're a subscriber to your Mac Life, and I encourage everyone to be a subscriber, it doesn't cost anything more than two bucks. Two bucks a month. You can afford two bucks a month. Send it to your favorite podcaster or to me. Whichever you choose, subscribe to your Mac Life for two, five, ten, fifteen bucks, whatever it might be. It comes out of your PayPal account or out of, off your credit card each and every month. Uh, you don't even notice it. It comes to me. Believe me, I notice it. I got to pay for Australia. I need your guys' help to pay for this trip to Australia. It's not cheap. Flying literally across the world is not cheap. And even worse, I found out. Now, I'm lucky I'm flying Cathay Pacific, which is a lovely airline. For those folks who are longtime listeners, you'll remember I went to Japan uh, back in the day for the very last Macworld Expo in Tokyo. I flew Cathay Pacific, and I still remember that flight. I remember how pleasant that flight was. But it's a 15-hour flight to Hong Kong and then a 9-hour flight from Hong Kong to Sydney. So I'm going to be jammed into coach for 23, 24 hours. Literally 24 hours in the air. So I need to get exit row. I need the extra leg room. Unfortunately, Cathay Pacific charges $150 for extra leg room seats, which pisses me off no end. As Melissa said, that's discrimination against tall people. So I got to pay an extra $600 above and beyond the cost of the ticket just to get leg room. Just so I don't get so grumpy that I kill people. I'm six foot three. Being jammed in a coach for 24 hours is going to be a living hell. So I at least want a bit more leg room. So I'm saving up my pennies to pay for this ticket and for the extra leg room. So if you can, if you can help out with that, it's going to be great. Uh, Dr. Dream mentioned earlier that he hoped I was going to take my camera. Of course I'm taking my camera. Oh my God, I'm taking my camera. Australia is going to be beautiful. It is going to be summertime down there. It's going to be a place I've never been before. I'm never, probably never going to go again. So I'm definitely going to be taking lots and lots of photos and posting them to the show. And I'm going to try to do the show down there too. Because otherwise it's going to be three weeks without a show, or two weeks without a show. I'm definitely going to try to do a Your Mac Life show from down there. I'll be taking some of my gear and hopefully I'll be able to uh, find the bandwidth to do the show from down there. 
Folks, that's it for tonight's show. Again, I want to say thanks to Mike Bombick of Bombick Software and Carbon Copy Cloner. And a big special, extra special thank you to Melissa for being on the show on such short notice. She was wonderful, and hopefully you guys enjoyed hearing her on the show. Until next week, as always, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to your Mac Life. See ya! See ya!